Righto, so today we're going to uh, talk, and actually I think the theme for this month is going to be faith favourites. So people of, from the Bible who we all know and we love, and today I want to talk a little bit on King David. King David was a passionate man. When reading through the life of David, it's obvious that he was a, he was a man who lived life on the edge. Now, I don't know whether it's still a saying, but when I was a bit younger, we used to have a saying that if you're not living life on the edge, you're taking up too much space. So David was a man who lived on the edge. And we can even see in the Bible that because he lived life on the edge, he actually fell over a couple of times. And when David, you know, he fell over when he took Bathsheba, who was Uriah the Hittite, um, Hittite's wife, he took her to be his own wife. And then he numbered the people sometime later, and that was one of God's specific commandments to the, um, to the kings of the Israelites was never to number the people. So on those two specific occasions, David fell over the edge. He, he, he was passionate about life. However, God restored him. So for David, he was a passionate man, but his greatest passion in life was his relationship with God. And because he was just a mortal man, just like you and me, he was fallible. But because he had a tender heart toward God, and he was teachable and instructable and correctable, God restored him when he did fall over the edge. So we're going to read from Psalm 139, and I've taken that out of the New Living Translation. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvellous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. O oh God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. O oh Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, or some versions I think say perfect hatred. For your enemies are my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me in the path everlasting. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, would you come and open your word to us this morning and be our teacher, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So point number one I have today is that David was in submission to God. Throughout his life, David was always seeking to be in right relationship with God. He wanted to learn more about God and of his goodness every single day. Psalm 1, 1 to 3 tells us, Blessed, and that's David speaking, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. 
but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. David's delight was to spend time with God, reading God's word, and, and that was for David only the first five books of the Bible, and he might have had, um, say, Joshua, Judges and Ruth. I'm not 100% sure what was actually written down for David by the time he was around. But David delighted in meditating on God's word. And so the first five books of the Bible, particularly what we call the Torah, the books recorded by Moses, they had the law, they had the ceremonial law, all those things, they were the ones that David delighted to spend time in. And quite often in our New Testament times, we find those first five books of the Bible possibly a little bit dry, a bit tough going, even a bit of a chore to read through. I mean, I know I can at times because there's lists of names and rules galore and, and, and they, can, they can seem even a little bit irrelevant at times. But that is all the scripture that David had and he delighted in it. From these scriptures, David knew a loving, kind, generous, merciful, saving, forgiving God who desired a personal relationship with him. And from these scriptures, David also understood of a coming saviour. And we know from our point in history that that saviour's name is Jesus. And so from Psalm 139, which we read, we can see that David was in submission to God. David wanted his own heart to care for all that God cared about. David desired to make sure that there was nothing in him that could get in the way of the relationship that he had with God. He wanted to be led by God in the right paths. Verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me in the path of everlasting life. I'm not sure if we, I know I don't always remember or realise who God actually is. I forget sometimes that, well, God is God. David says, Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. So if that, to you, like me, sounds a bit concerning at times, then we both need to take on a bit more of David's submissive heart. Is it a concern to you and me that God has, that's past tense, has already examined our heart and knows everything about us? He knows our innermost thoughts. He knows the words that we're about to say even before we say them. He knows what we look at on the internet behind closed doors with a locked key. He knows every book that we read. Sometimes this gives me a start to remember that this is God. But it's comforting to know that even though God knows all these things, he still loves us. We would do well to cultivate a heart like David's, a heart attitude that not only knows that God sees all that we do, all that we think and all that we say, but an attitude that invites God, invites him to come in and inspect our hearts, to analyse our thoughts and to point out anything, anything at all that offends him. <coughs> it's kind of a bit like working at a job, I guess. Your employer is far more likely to promote and look, up, look after somebody who keeps the company's best interests at the forefront of their mind. An employee who is teachable and who seeks the employer's feedback on how they're doing at the job and if there's anything that they could do to do it better is going to be the person that the employer looks to and promotes and, um, and wants to work with. 
So if, if you know, we come to our job with the intention of telling the employer how to do the job best and how to run the company, well, we're most, most likely gonna find ourselves in the office yes. being told to pull up our socks, to ship up or shave out, or we'll be on our skates out the front door. So we need to have a heart like David's and to take a, a page out of David's book and to actively seek God's feedback on every, every aspect of our lives, to submit humbly to God and to, to, um, to do things God's way and to be teachable. When God gives us instructions on how to do life, they just work. If we can train ourselves to be submitted to God in the same way that King David was, then we can sincerely believe the words of Psalm 23, that they will be as real for us as they were for him. That same peace that David had in submission to God can be ours too. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Or the Lord, you know, all the, the, all the promises that are in Psalm 23. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, somebody who knows more about sheep than I do says sheep only lie down when they've actually fully eaten and they're, they're completely satisfied. So to be lying down in green pastures means God has satisfied us. So these are the things that were real to David because of that relationship that he pursued with God and that openness that he had with God. My point number two is that David was in submission to God's anointed earthly authority. 1 Samuel 16 verse 1 says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. King Saul made a mistake. It's a mistake that could almost seem reasonable given the circumstances that uh, he found himself in. And you can read all about it in 1 Samuel and chapter 13. So um, Saul had the, the Philistine army encamped against him. And the, the word tells us that they had 3,000 chariots and 6,000 people to man those chariots and armed men like the number of the sand on the seashore. And that King Saul had 3,000 men at his disposal and very, very few uh, pieces of weaponry because the Philistines had forbidden the Israelites from having any weapons of their own. So Saul wasn't in a good place. And he was waiting for Samuel the prophet to come and offer the sacrifice to God that uh, was supposed to happen within seven days. Now, seven days had come to pass and, the, and many of those 3,000 men that Saul did have, they were slinking off to hide in caves and to cross the border into other lands. And Saul was getting concerned, so he took it on himself to offer that sacrifice to God. And that was one of the, the main reasons that God actually rejected him. Now that may sound a bit harsh, but it wasn't for a mistake or two that Saul made that he was rejected. It was for his attitude, his heart attitude. So yeah, we have a king here that God had rejected, and we're told in scripture that God had withdrawn his spirit from Saul. And it was this man who stood between David and the throne for around 15 years. And that's the time it took between when David was anointed with oil by Samuel to be the next king until he actually became the king of Israel. So what, was, what then was David's attitude towards King Saul? Well, how about we ask, what would your or my attitude towards King Saul have been in the same situation? In those 15 long years, David referred to King Saul as the Lord's anointed and he refused to say a bad word about King Saul and he refused to even hear a bad word about King Saul. David faithfully served King Saul and more than that, he actively honoured King Saul. David played the harp to calm King Saul when an evil spirit would be sent upon him to trouble him. What do we do when we see our political leaders acting in what appears to be a, a demonic influence? <laughs> in Romans 13 verses 1 to 7, 
it tells us that we are to submit to our political leaders because they are appointed by God. And this is the same attitude that David has demonstrated for us. In 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 3, we're told to pray for our political leaders. The first of God's requirements in Romans was to submit to them, and the second of his requirements is to pray for them. I'm going to read it because it's rather important, the 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 3. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Do you, or do I, want to live a quiet and peaceful life? If that's what we want, then God says to pray good things for our political leaders, because that is what petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving, <clears throat> and thanksgiving means. It means asking God for good things for those people. More than that, the, the, uh, the text tells us that it is accounted to us as godliness and holiness when we pray this way for our leaders. Verse 3 and 4 tell us, This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Yes, God even wants our political leaders to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as we have saving faith in Jesus, he wants them to have that same like faith. But just as David honoured King Saul and sought for his success, not his destruction, that should be our attitude to the political leaders that God has anointed or appointed for us too. Hence why on that slide we had just up before, we're going to actually give some positive feedback to our politicians and we're, we're to actually encourage them. And then of course behind the scenes we need to be praying for them and asking God's favour for them and asking God's salvation that his Holy Spirit will fill them and that our halls of parliament will become filled with praises of God. You know, these things that um, we would love to see happen, these are the things we need to be asking God for and to have faith for. But David, he did more than that. He served in King Saul's army and he became a high-ranking officer. So this is David who'd been anointed to be the next king. He put his life on the line time and time again in service of King Saul. And he became, he became famous for his success in battle in all of Israel. So yes, this is King Saul whom God had rejected. David, the next anointed king, spent time in the army and risked his life in service of this man, King Saul. Saul became exceedingly jealous of David because of the fame that he gained from his battlefield success and Saul began to actually uh, hunt David down and trying to kill him. And during that time that David was forced to go on the run, a large group of men gathered to him, people who were discontent with King Saul. And instead of using those men to, to take out King Saul, David and his men actively defended Israel from its foreign enemies. And on two separate occasions, David was in a position to take out King Saul. David's own men even begged him to do the job himself or if he wouldn't do it to allow them to take out King Saul. They probably called him wicked King Saul, I don't know. And in Samuel, or 1 Samuel chapter 24 verses 3 to 7, we read, A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He has to be pretty quiet to do that, I tell you. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. 
And on a second occasion, we read in 1 Samuel 26, 8 to 11. Um, I'm just going to pronounce these names as they come to my head. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't need to strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now the time did come when King Saul perished in battle, and the scripture tells us that he took his own life. So he was badly wounded and uh, the enemy forces were almost upon him. So instead of allowing himself to be captured, he chose to kill himself. Now, unfortunately, that's a very sad end to uh, King Saul's kingdom. But how do we react when our political leaders fall? I'm guessing it's probably words I've spoken myself. Couldn't have happened to a nicer bloke. <laughs> Good riddance to bad rubbish. But what was David's response? David's response was, Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan, and for the army of the Lord and the nation of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. David's heart was rare in his day. Unfortunately, there was a young man who came running after the battle to David. David hadn't been part of that battle. He'd been still in hiding. And the young man brought word to David of King Saul's death and the death of Jonathan and his, his other sons. And this young man thought that he would gain some favour by modifying the story slightly and saying that he himself had killed King Saul. Unfortunately, that wasn't David's heart. And so David... Because of this young man's testimony, David had him executed to uphold King Saul's honour and to take vengeance in King Saul's name. So David, right up until the very last of King Saul, held him in honour and served him, even though the scripture tell us that he had been rejected by the Lord. Unfortunately, I think King David's heart is still rare today. It's an ongoing learning journey with God, for me, to develop godly, to develop and hold godly attitudes towards earthly leaders, towards our political leaders, our prime minister, our, our um, you know, what do we call our state uh, premiers? Yeah, that word, premiers. You know, all these things, they're not easy. They take work. We've actually got to practice referring to them in godly ways. And David modelled these things for us 3,000 years ago. We're still trying to get our heads around them. So point number three, David was a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14 says, You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. This is speaking to King Saul, I believe. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. As we've seen in the first two points, David's heart was one of submission to God and submission to the earthly leader or earthly ruler that God had appointed. In reality, they are both the same point because you simply cannot be in submission to God without being in submission to the earthly leaders, our political leaders, uh, you know, those whom God has put in authority in the state. We can't be in submission to God without being in submission to those, those people because God tells us he personally appoints them. It may not look like that to us, but the scriptures do tell us that God is the one who raises up leaders and God is the one who casts them down again. It looks rather natural. It almost looks like it's out of our control. However, nothing is out of God's control. 
So yes, if you and I would want to hear God say of us, as he did of David, I have sought out a man or woman after my own heart and appointed them to be, might be mayor of Blackall, it might be premier of Queensland, it, it might be CEO of a company, but whatever it is, if we want to hear God say of us that we are a man or a woman after his own heart, then we must have David's heart of submission. If we want God's eternal blessing on our appointments, then, like David, we must be those who have a, a heart of submission both to God and to the earthly leaders that he's appointed to have authority over us. So just a quick note here, submission and obedience do differ. Obedience to political leaders is good and right, right up until the point that they order us to commit sin, that is, to directly disobey God. And we're told this in the scriptures. So in that instance, disobedience to earthly authority is still to be done in a spirit of submission, as modelled in Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So even in that situation, those men made no accusations, they didn't yell, they didn't... Um, they didn't revile the king and tell him exactly what they thought of him and his decree. They were polite, they used his, his title, your majesty, and they were acting in a spirit of submission, even though they actually had to defy him in the name of the Lord. So David could have taken matters into his own hands and killed King Saul. After all, he was anointed to be the next king and Saul had been rejected by God. David certainly had the support and the encouragement of his followers to take that path in killing King Saul. However, had David taken this path the easy way and killed King Saul himself, he would not have been blessed. His kingdom would not have been established for all time as what God did for him later in his life. David's kingdom would have been rejected by God in the same way that King Saul's kingdom was rejected. And we see that time and time again in the northern kingdom of Israel after, after King Solomon's reign had ended and the kingdom split into two. In the northern kingdom, some bloke, the general of the army or whatever, would kill the king and he would be king instead of the king. And, and next thing, somebody else had risen up against him and killed him and there was no real continuity of a kingly line in that northern kingdom. And we see the same through many secular nations throughout history where, you know, one person kills the king and their family doesn't last for long before somebody kills them and so on. So David did things God's way. God uh, established his kingdom for all time. Now... I get it. Most of us are never going to be in position to be anointed and in line to be the next king or queen of Australia. We're not going to be facing the temptation to, to bump off the current person, the current <laughs> king or queen, to make it faster to get into the position ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> but right here in our day and age, God is appointing and anointing people to be CEOs, to be managers, to be city councillors, to be mayors, to be judges, politicians, you name it, in positions of leadership, God is calling people to those positions. But we need to be aware that God's way is one of a heart of submission to those who are already in authority. And God will raise us up, just like he did David, in the right time, at the right, you know, at the right time and in the right way. And there's a principle of sowing and reaping involved here. In the kingdom of God, Jesus tells us we reap what we sow. Now David made it his business to serve and to honour the Lord's anointed king, even though it was hard work. King Saul was even trying to kill David at times. Because David sowed service and honour while he was waiting, 
he reaped service and honour in abundance in his own kingdom when he was finally placed on the throne at the right time by God. If we will serve and honour the leaders God has already appointed, who's our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, is it? If we will serve and honour our Prime Minister, whom God has appointed, we will reap an abundance of the same of service and honour when God promotes us in his time. So for us, we're more, uh, we're more likely to be, you know, promoted at work or um, maybe become a councillor and then the mayor or things like that. But the same principle applies. If we have a heart of honour and submission to God and to those who are in authority over us in this world, God will raise us up and God will bless those appointments when he puts them in, puts us into them. So whether it's... Um, oh, yeah, so in all these things, God has given us free will. So whether it's salvation or marriage, or finance or climbing the corporate ladder, we always have a choice of doing things God's way or trying to, doing, or trying to do it in our own way. Let me tell you from personal experience, when God gives instructions on how to do life, they just work. They work a whole lot better than the mess I've made for myself in many occasions throughout life, doing it my way first. For God is the all-powerful one who created all things, who knows all things, including the thoughts of our hearts and the words that we speak even before we speak them. But yeah, what would our heart, uh, what would our world look like if we all had hearts of submission like David? If our cry to God was, "Search me, O God, and know my heart; test me and know my anxious thoughts; point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me along the path of everlasting life." What if we would pray God's blessing over our bosses, our politicians? those in earthly authority over us and genuinely desire their best good and their salvation. If we would serve them and honour them with a heart understanding that God has appointed them, even those who are difficult to like, and if we had David's attitude of, God forbid that I should lay a hand on God's anointed. I believe if we would follow God's way, just like David did, then, just like God did for David, he would pour out his blessings over us, our families, our churches, flowing onto our nation in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. So if we all had that same heart of David, imagine that there's people who are service managers, there's people who are in regular jobs, they're waiting for God's promotion. Those who are in the positions of authority have got David's heart of submission to God and submission to those who are above them. And so it goes on. We see from the Bible what happened during King David's reign, how the whole of the land of Israel was a godly nation because of King David and his heart of submission to God and how he submitted to the authority that was in place before he was raised up to be king. So imagine how our world, our nation could be if we all had that same heart of submission to God and submission to those who are currently in authority over us. Because then when God promotes us, he would pour out that same blessing on us as he did on King David. So there's sowing and there's reaping at play. And God wants to bless us. We need to have that heart that David had. Submission to God, submission to our earthly authorities, including Anthony Albanese. We'll leave it back. So, Father, I thank you that you have given us the way to live. I thank you that your ways are life-giving. I thank you, Father, that um, when we do things your way, you pour out blessing upon us in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Father, would you give us David's heart of submission, submission first and foremost to you. Father, we invite you, come, search our hearts, know everything that is within us, point out to us anything that offends you. Lord, we invite you to clean us up, clean our hearts, clean up our lives. And Father, help us to submit to the political, the earthly authorities that you've put in, uh, in place. Lord, that 
when you raise us up, that we may have your blessing upon us. And I thank you, Father, that you do so much better at these things than we can when we try them in our own way. Lord, would you bless us this week? Bless your people as we go forth. May our weeks be filled with um, the knowledge of your goodness. Father, those divine appointments that you've prepared beforehand for us, help us to find them, to see them, and have the courage to step into them. May we be salt and light in our communities, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we'll close for the song, and then um, once again, as I said earlier, anybody who uh, wants to be part of making cakes for birthdays at the end of each month, just um, stay back for a minute and we'll have a quick chat together after the service. Thank you.